So, hello. Um, so we, tonight we are going to talk about Primer and most specifically why you should care. Because it got mentioned during the uh, recent Google I.O. but they didn't, then, they didn't really explain why you should use it. There are many other alternatives. And one specific slide that I want to mention... Uh, wait, I'm going too fast. So, let's start again. Um, let's be honest. To begin with, Brider was uh, existed for a very long time, like more than a year, and you probably haven't heard about it before. Uh, it got really popular very recently because of the Google I.O. talk. Uh, and I happen to have uh, made it, so let's see what it is. Um, I could make a very technical talk about Brider and uh, explain what it does, like how to pass a value. For example, you wrap a widget and pass it a value and then descendants can access it using Brider or Hoff. It's a classical stuff. But instead, we're going to focus on, on something slightly different. We're going to focus on this slide. Because this slide says that Google tried to make their own version of Brider. And for some reason, they didn't use it. They used some mine. Which is cool. <laughs> um, so we are going to discuss about why they made the decision, or at least why I think they made the decision. Um, the reality is that both versions are very, very simple libraries that could be written in very a few hundred lines of code. And they don't do that much, they don't have that much features. They just pass data around, they just wrap the inherited widget. So why does that choice matter? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, it's, it's about a time where MobX didn't exist. And that tickers ne never. It was a very sad time. So at the time, I was already quite addicted to Flutter, uh, to Flutter and I spent most of my days answering on Stack Overflow, and still do today. And um, I was quite bothered at that time because easily 10 times a week, we, I had the same kind of question, which was uh, a simple mistake that people do, and everybody fell on that trap because the API is designed in such a way that people do that mistake. So I got very desperate because every time I answered the question, another one asked the same one later. And even, I answer, even if I answer again, then it keeps repeating again and again and again and again. And we never stop the cycle. So I tried something different. First, I, st I started talking to myself. So I made a question, like everybody else do, and I answered myself. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, got quite a few different reactions from the community. It, it's actually totally fine to do in Stack Overflow. It's actually recommended. But um, the funny thing about that question and answer is that I didn't actually answer myself. You see, in that question, I said how to somehow prevent rebuilding widgets because sometimes it rebuilds too often and it causes problems. And my answer is basically that you probably don't want that. So why did I contradict myself? Am I crazy? Yeah, probably. But um, you see, there is a reason to that answer. You could, um, uh, you could uh, name it using the XY problem. Basically, for those who are not familiar with the problem, is it's a psychological effect where we have a problem and we want to solve that, that problem. Uh, and that problem is called Higgs. And uh, we think that Y is a solution to that problem but we don't know how to implement why. So we Google, we search on the internet uh, how to do why, but the reality is that we want to do X, not Y. And the thing is, often Y is not the solution and there is something more uh, which fits more to your problem. And in that case, in that specific uh, question and answer, it was that case. People uh, try to 
stop rebuilding widgets because they think that it's the solution. But actually, you don't want to prevent rebuild. You want to make it more resilient, such that rebuilding more often don't break your app. So that's why I contradict it myself. But, you know, I'm still not satisfied with that answer. Because, okay, people start Googling it and they find it. But there's still an issue. You see, I'm, I'm solving an issue after they had a problem. So I'm kind of putting a bandage on someone that tripped on the road. But you see, they're still tripping on the road every time. It's not very good. So why can't we do something to prevent them from falling so that I don't have to fix them every time? And that's why we have provider. The goal of provider is exactly just what I described. It's to have a very good default behavior such that people don't fall into these kinds of traps. Um, uh, it takes my experience from Stack Overflow and it uh, combines the different issues that people face and tweaks the API that people are usually used to, change them slightly to make them more resilient to these kinds of problems. So the thing is, provider really focus on solving this kind of trap. It doesn't focus on solving absolutely every single problem in the world. It focuses on the very uh, specific set of problems. And it doesn't focus neither on having the best performance in the world. It's really just about making your life easier. So in that, in that sense, in that continuation, provider is not scope model. It does some similarities, yes, sure. And if you combine, for example, provider with something like change notifier, if you know what is that class is, then you can have an architecture that looks very similar to scope model. But you see, um, state management is a very big topic, and provider is not the world. It doesn't, it doesn't claim to solve the world topic. It's just a little piece of state management. And Usually you want to combine many different architectures to have your real application, you have your real robust application. And provider really aim at making your, uh, really, really aim at being generic enough so, such that you can combine provider with more mainstream features like Scott or Block or Redux or whatever. So you can use provider to fix these kind of issues and keep using your favorite uh, pattern. Um, so let's get a bit more technical. Like I said before, to expose a value, it's pretty straightforward. You create a provider widget. You specify <coughs> the type of the value which you want to provide and you send give it a child the, where, where this child can access the, da the data that was provided using a different method that is a static method provider.off. And that provider.off takes a type that we specified earlier and the context used uh, in the build method that the, the context that was passed to the build method that the widget need to, wow, very difficult. Mm. It's the build context used by the widget that need to access the data. And there is a second way to consume the data, which is a widget called consumer, which takes that type again. And the reality is that consumer widget is just syntax sugar for provider of. They don't do anything different Really, it really is just, just the, same code, the same code formatted differently. Uh, yeah. And not that you can replace your provider with many different alternatives of provider. There is provider for immutable data, but you can also use change notifier provider for change notifier or stream provider for or streams, okay, and you get the idea. There are a few others. 
And one thing that I want to note is that provider, even if it, it even if it's used to expose immutable data, doesn't mean that there will never be any kind of update on the data. The so data is immutable, but you can, for example, rebuild your widget tree with a new kind of with a new data, with a new instance of the data, and then the change will be propagated. And um, notice one how provider takes a builder instead of what uh, most uh, similar inherited widgets takes. Um, that functions, fun that parameter is, is a function for a reason. Uh, because you see, most of the time, uh, they take a single value, but that single value is misleading because it makes people think that they can instantiate the, uh, the value directly inside the build method. But for example, if you take the code snippets from the write and you run that on your application, then you may have memory leaks or you may lose your state on auto reload. Or for example, if you ship it into your production, into production, and you may find that when you open your keyboard, for example, you lose your state, and it's very bad. So for that reason, provider takes a builder, which will be called only once in the, the first time the widget is instantiated. This way, you're, gu you're guaranteed that the state will be preserved, whatever you do. It also for uh, an optional name constructor to still offer that custom value behavior in case you have a more complex feature. But th that's really the idea that the default behavior is, very, is made to be robust enough such that you don't fall into the typical trap. And um, if you see this and you're probably thinking, well, it's just an inherited, it's just an inherited widget. And you're probably right. But you see, there are, why did I use an inherited widget? Because there are many different ways of passing data around, like you could use globals or singletons. You could use like packages like get it or inject.dart. So why widgets to do some of these kinds of passing data around? Well, the thing is, the raw Flutter API is very, very user-friendly, and widgets do a lot more than we think. There are, very, there are very powerful ways to structure your data and to control how you edit your state. And a provider recognizes that and is purposefully built on the top of the widgets API to benefits of the widget API, the bonuses of the widget API. So for example, uh, one of the typical uh, gains that we get is that, for example, if you use a typical global pattern or get it or whatever, then there is nothing that prevents you from falling into the left, the right picture, because you can access your data from literally anywhere. So you can have circular dependencies and everything gets messy as your app grows bigger. But uh, provider prevents you, at least in some kind of way, to get this messy data structure. Because the way the widget tree is designed is that it's just a tree. And since it's a tree with very limited way of uh, navigating into that tree, then a node of the tree can't access any kind of data. It just have a very limited uh, data. It just have a very limited number of data you can access. So we can't access, say, uh, any kind of system, yeah. Um, and what we call that is the unidirectional data flow. Basically, the data is passed in, in a single direction from top to bottom, and then there is usually some kind of trigger that pass data uh, in the other direction. It's, uh, it's very strict, and there is no inter-exchange inter between components in linearly in, or in the in the horizontal axis. And that's a very powerful uh, data flow because 
uh, one of the main advantage of unidir uh, unidirectional data flow is that if you get very deep into your widget tree, then you don't have to care about what the rest of the app do when you modify that part of the widget tree, because you know that you can't modify the rest of the widget tree. So you know that if you modify that specific deep part of your widget tree, then you know it won't have any impact on the rest of your app and you won't break anything. Um, so we can say that providers are scoped. They are limited to a, a part of the widget tree. And there are many ways to deal with uh, scope providers. For example, in that code snippets, we made the provider on one specific route. So the home route can access to our full model, but the route route can't. Alternatively, alternatively, we could make our class private. So if you don't have the access to the type of the class, then you can't read the data. Uh, but then you might uh, fall into a, a common trap is that if you want to expose two different values of the same type, like two strings, then you will see that you can access the deepest value, but you can't access the top value. And that's actually uh, voluntary, because the deepest value will override the top level value. But to, if you want to access, to access both values independently, then you will have to use a different type. You can tr create uh, mock types, like for example, we could uh, create a greeting type that takes a string and a city type that takes a city. And then we can uh, access independently using a provider.off greeting or provider.off city each value independently. It also makes your code more readable because when you come back later and you do a provider.off string, you might wonder what that string is. But if you do provider dot of city, then you know it's a city. And um, another reason uh, for, uh, for why we like the fact that providers are scoped is that it makes a very clear hook on when you should dispose your model. Because since your models are scoped to a tree, then when you remove that tree, you know that you can remove that model because nobody else can access it. It also makes your test, uh, your models always, your widgets and models always testable because they don't ever uh, use the direct implementation of the class. They use some kind of abstraction layers that is the inherited widget so we can override it and we can Come, we can replace it with something else and mock it. It also makes your widgets more, more composable for the same reason. You, since uh, you can override it, you could potentially um, use different, uh, different provided values depending on where you are in the tree to obtain a different effect. Another thing that providers are is that they are reactive. For example, when we use provider.off inside the build method, then you will notice that when our provided value change, then it will automatically, automatically rebuild the, uh, the widgets that depend on the value. And you never had to do anything, it just, it just worked by itself. It's purposefully the default value that when you do provider.off, then it will subscribe the widget that called provider.off to the v provided value. Uh, but then you might think, okay, I can do provider.off in inside my in state, but no, that won't work because you, uh, you're trying to uh, call in state, which is a lifecycle that is called only once but you're using a value that can update, which means that you probably have a bug because what happens when the value update? So uh, it purposefully uh, will not, it, it, it will purposefully crash because you're trying to 
you're, you're, you forgot to handle the update scenario. So you have a few solutions in that case. The most common one is to use the change dependencies, which requires slightly more boilerplate, but it will automatically, autom automatically handle the update scenario. In that case, for example, if foo re uh, change, then it will automatically, automatically call f the fetch method again. Alternatively, if you are sh certain that your instance will never change, you can pass listen.false to the provider. In that case, it will uh, explicitly not listen to the provided value using a custom method uh, from the context API, such that uh, since it is, it is explicit that you don't want to listen to the object, then when you do your code re review, for example, then you are sure that you don't want to listen to the object. You can't, just, uh, you can't uh, mistakenly forget to subscribe to the object. Uh, another way to handle reactivity using provider is, is a, a, pri a provider that got recently added, which is proxy provider. It comes in many different kinds, like change notifier proxy provider. And the idea behind it is that it uses the change dependencies that we saw earlier, and it um, uses that lifecycle to combine different providers together and uh, such that the builder method we see here will be called again whenever one of the dependencies change. This way you can, you can be uh, almost certain that your models will be always kept up to date without doing anything special. And uh, what's next? Because uh, the Pro, uh, the, pro, uh, the, uh, very the next feature will be uh, lazy loading for providers. It will come with um, a new constructors on different providers like providers, provider dot lazy. The only difference with the default constructor in that case is that it will call the builder only when you first access the value, such that if you never read the value, then the value is never instantiated, obviously. But there is a twist. You could also push that feature a bit deeper. And for example, if you do change notifier provider dot lazy, then uh, the subscription which is made on the change notifier will be lazy too, such that when you stop listening to the the, uh, the change notifier, then the provider will stop listening to the change notifier too. Another thing that may come up is a new kind of way to deal with change notifiers. One of, this limitation, one of the limitations of change notifier is that they're very bad at dealing Im with immutable data. And immutable data are very cool and very uh, powerful tools to prevent bugs. So since we, as a goal operator, is to prevent bugs, then obviously I want to push a bit, a bit more immutable data. So in that case, uh, we will, that's the API that will be probably added, which is quite similar to state of stateful widget. It will provide a set state method and expose a single value such that when you call set states, then the provider can know something changed and provide that by you, yeah. Another thing that may come up is um, different bindings between provider and different kind of libraries like Mobix or Flutterblock. Uh, Flutterblock is still not certain, but Mobix will definitely come up. Uh, for example, what it will do is um, help like with proxy provider to internally have a reaction such that when you listen to a value, it will, if you're familiar with Mobex, you know that it has a very weird way of dealing with updates in your, your model. 
and it kind of breaks. Uh, it's kind of not. It's kind of not comparable with most most providers. So that that uh, binding will fix that, such that providers will work. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Mm. Anybody have any questions for Remy? Nick. Uh, okay, so this is a little bit anally retentive, and you should all boo me if this is a stupid question that should never be asked. Um, your builder methods yeah. within the providers. Builder, in my head at least, has a particular meaning, especially within the widget tree, which is that it's going to provide a function which will ultimately return a widget. Now, these builders aren't doing that. I wondered why you chose Builder as the key to use for that field, and mm. if there may be confusion amongst we development idiots um, occasionally because of that. Well, um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there, there are some kind of confusions. But I thought about changing it because it was a mistake I made some time ago, but uh, honestly, I don't think the change really matter since it's a type language. So if you try to return a, a widget, the compiler will tell you that it's, it, should, it won't work. So I don't think it's worth the breaking change. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Evelina. Um, I'm uh, very new to Flutter, so probably I'm doing most of the things wrong, but um, I ended up using a stream builder and a stream provider. <laughs> so I wonder if you have like some tips when one is more useful than other, and if like the stream provider encapsulates some behavior that you have in stream builder. For example, like the loading state and the error state. I don't, I'm not quite sure how to use that with the stream provider, so maybe you have some tips, mm. thanks. The, the idea behind stream provider is that uh, I don't quite like async snapshot because it has a lot of boilerplate associated and the way errors are handled is quite uh, unclear because streams don't specifically tell if they emit an error or not. So when we listen to a stream, we don't know if we have to handle the error scenario. So the idea behind stream provider is that it merge all the, approach, the different approaches in such that if there is an, an error, then you should specifically handle it uh, to return a valid value. And so if you want to handle things like loading state or, error or errors, then it's your model that should uh, contain like a loading boolean or a narrow object. Is that clear? Um, so, sorry. So normally, when I use a stream builder, I do things like if snapshot has yeah. <laughs> value, if snapshot has error. Um, what you're saying is, in a stream provider, um, those are like callbacks, or yeah, they are callbacks on the stream provider. There is a catch error callback on stream provider such that, uh, that is required to return the model that will be emitted. Mm -hmm. So the model itself would kind of contain all the state, yeah. uh, loading and error mm -hmm. and the value. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you. Anybody else? Ah, Rafael. So, hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask. Um, What's uh, the idea behind the new uh, API, the, the one with set state, uh, the, the store yeah. API, while we, while we want to uh, make the bindings for MOBEX? Would it, it be better to focus 100% and make one solution and have like the change notifier, which is there already, and don't do the store, which is probably got from Redux? And then no, it's use. not very Redux-like. It's more like uh, if you want. Um, I mean, the name is from Redux. Well, it's also it's also from it's also from Mobix too. They have a store. Yes, yeah, so that's why why don't make one solution like 
only the MOBEX. Well, the idea behind Proider is that it should work with uh, most, if not all, solutions. So I can't really uh, promote one architecture specifically. It's uh, there such that any any architecture should be should could potentially depend on provider or be combined with provider. So it can't have uh, strong dependencies like depending on Mobex or anything else. Um, and even then, there is always a situation where you will want to mix up different types of data. For example, you can use a, a Mobex for, if you want, but at some point you will have, a, say, configuration, and your configuration don't need to be a Mobex store. In that case, it will be a plain class and, um, or custom logic, whatever. And so in that case, you are in a weird scenario where you have you know, some stores some from Mobix and some things that are not from Mobix, and you need to them to communicate together. So Provider is here to help uh, this kind of communication to handle different types of data and merge them together. So which one would you prefer? Mm. I don't have any strong preference because they all have their pros, their pros and cons. For example, Mobix is, is uh, very good for, in, for its simplicity. Uh, it has a very small amount of boilerplate compared to something like Block or something like that. But the issue is that it's mutable and you may, you, usually it will work, but in some scenario you will have um, issues where you, your mutation calls undesired behaviors. And uh, for example, there is also a more specific use case where, for example, you want to do some features like under redo. In that case, you will want to have uh, an immutable, immutable data because it makes things so much easier. So yeah, we really don't want to focus on one very specific implementation of the state and, foc and uh, offer many different ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, so can you tell us how did your collaboration with Google started in this package? Mm, well, sure. Uh, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> it wasn't very, nothing special. Uh, I just saw that uh, they made their version of Provider, which was a different version of uh, Scott model based. And I honestly didn't really like their API, very honestly. And uh, so I didn't want to solve questions on Stack Overflow of problems from their API. So I went on their repository and I told them that I didn't like their API. And there is a nice conversation about expl uh, where I explain what I don't like and what I think could be improved, things like that. And somehow I managed to convince them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Ah, Simon, of course. <laughs> of course. Uh, I heard there was a breaking change in provider recently uh, to do with naming. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Um, well, sure. There was a bit uh, of uh, inconsistent naming with providers where. Um, for example, change notifier provider used uh, notifier as a name for, you know, uh, providers have two different kind of constructors usually. The default constructor, which takes a builder, and the value constructor, which takes uh, the direct instance of the object. And um, the different versions of providers uh, had a very different ways of naming that value constructor. So that break and change uniformized these namings. And uh, another break and change that came uh, with that change, which is more important, is the default constructor on stream provider. Uh, or originally, it uh, was asked to return a stream controller instead of, of stream. And it was quite uh, uh, unsettling. People used the... Um, value constructor to 
to um, build their streams and they, they fell on the scenarios that uh, was explained earlier where they, cre they created their stream directly inside the build method instead of the callback, which caused much bigger issues. So it was decided to make that broken change to make the default constructor return stream and make the previous behavior a name constructor instead such that people still fall into that trap. A few minutes left, come on. What about any other random flutter questions? Simon's here, take advantage of the opportunity. <laughs> Yay. Don't go red, Simon. Yeah, so general question. Uh, can you think of any um, really specific issues in the Flutter apps? So once you release an application to Play Store, were there any specific issues? I mean, on Android, we need to uh, think about, for example, ProGuard, if it didn't delete some fields we wanted to have or something like this. Two things that came up actually recently. Uh, it's worth mentioning, if you're gonna release an app, there's two functions you need to override that most people don't. Um, error widget builder. So that nice red screen with the yellow text that you always see while you're developing, that fun one. Uh, if that happens during production, people kind of get annoyed because they're seeing some random sort of developer garbage. So uh, there's actually a, a method that you can override, uh, error widget builder, and you can provide your own widget. So, uh, so during production apps, you get a nice little error screen with a cat pouring at the screen or something saying something went wrong. Uh, the other one is, um, I think it's flutter error dot on error. Yeah. And that's the callback that you override so that if there is an internal uh, problem inside Flutter during like building widgets, some messes up with provider, um, you actually get uh, uh, the error details come back and then you can log that off to your own server, Sentry, Crashlytics, wherever. Good question. Come on, some people must be using Flutter daily. Hey, Swef. Uh, Remy, you probably know what the question will be. Um, what is that date change dependencies method for, and can we live without oh. it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a discussion with uh, with Swavir a bit earlier. Um, if we take a look at that code snippet, um, there is uh, potentially an issue with that code snippet uh, that may happen in some kind of uh, in some rare scenarios. Um, the thing is, there is actually no guarantee that the build method will be called after dependency, change dependencies is called. Um, usually it does, but um, for example, uh, when you have, uh, say, it may be easier if I write it. Wait, wait a second. Let's open the editor. Okay. No. Maybe. Where is it? Here. Okay. Very nice timing. <laughs> With. No. Okay. Mm, and I don't see anything else. On. So uh, we usually will have, um, let's remove everything. We usually will have some kind of, for example, provider dot value for whatever reason. And it takes a value and then you have a child which depend on that value. Let's say a constant stateful widget, stateful. Okay. Yeah. Um, the thing is, when you switch from that widget tree to uh, through a set state to that widget tree, where stateful is removed from the tree for whatever reason, but the value provided changed such that 
update should notify return true on your inherited widget, then the did change dependencies of that stateful widget will be called. But the stateful widget is actually removed from the tree, which means that uh, your did change dependencies potentially have started uh, some HTTP requests that is actually not needed at all because the widget will be removed. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's not natural at all. Simon said the solution is mounted. And no. <laughs> if mounted. And actually, Sorry, it doesn't work. For... No, because uh, if mounted is true inside digital dependencies. Okay. It's a bug. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got any questions for us? All right, it's time to go to the pub then. So we go normally to the pub, which is inside the full street station next to the es uh, elevators. Escalators, I beg your pardon. No, I'm English as well. <laughs> right, so, yep, follow some of the, uh, Simon will show the way. Just follow Simon. And <laughs> thank you. Thanks for